Hello and good morning all. My name is Derek Ramsey. I will be the moderator for this session, uh, the session titled The Road Beyond, Setting Sakai Strategic Roadmap for 2022 to 2024. Uh, this session will be presented by Josh Wilson. Josh Wilson is Longsight's Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. He leads client relations, business operations, project management, product development, and strategic planning. He has been a leader in academic technology, technology for more than a decade, serving most recently as Associate CIO for Academic Technology at Brandeis University, where he directed the strategic and client-centered renewal of the university's academic technology environment, including its open source LMS. Joss has served more than a decade on the management team for the Nationwide MISO Survey, which measures the effectiveness of IT and libraries at more than 150 higher education institutions. Josh chairs the Sakai community's marketing team, leads the development of Sakai's three-year roadmap, and serves on Sakai's project management committee. Josh? You are muted, Josh. There we go. All right, multiple muting and unmuting buttons. Hi all, um, great to be with you. Uh, it looks like the recording is on, right, Derek? That is correct, we are recording. Okay, terrific. Well, welcome then to this session about the Sakai Roadmap for 2022 to 2024. So this is less a presentation and more an opportunity to begin to seek feedback on the roadmap. So this is the third time out of the gate for us. We have, uh, we've done a three-year roadmap two times before, and it's been a great way to help us get organized as a community, get some, uh, get some, um, agreements set among ourselves to figure out, how, you know, how best to move Sakai forward. So let me set the stage just a little bit, and then we'll dive into the roadmap itself. I'll talk through what is currently proposed to be on the roadmap. It's too much. That's the TLDR. So we need some help from you guys and some feedback, figuring out what's most important so we can curate this roadmap and come up with a, with a set of things that can be accomplished in uh, in calendar year 2021 for Sakai 22 and beyond. All right, so let's let's dive in. So the first question we need to ask ourselves, and we ask ourselves this every year, is why do we need a roadmap in the first place? And this roadmap really allows us to. Um, it allows us to get ourselves organized in terms of where we want to go. It allows us to make some decisions about directions and sequencing of when we want to go in those directions so that we're not forever reopening those decisions and thinking about them again and again. There's a lot of organizational churn and energy that goes into reopening those decisions. So having a roadmap process, setting a roadmap allows us to focus ourselves on actually making the improvements that we want to make once we've set the roadmap. So, and where does this roadmap lead us? This roadmap leads us to a place with uh, children running in the streets without masks. It's kind of amazing. Um, the, the roadmap really takes us to a place where institutions know what's coming in Sakai, both so that they can plan from a functional perspective at their institutions and set their faculty and student expectations, but also so that they can contribute in meaningful kinds of ways. It takes us to a place where uh, Sakai is known in the LMS community and beyond as an energetic, innovative piece of software that's got a really great UI and is moving forward at a really good clip. It takes us to a place where we are aware of how we need to contribute as community members to get to those places. And, uh, and, and it also takes us to a place where we're really well aware of what our release cycle and what our release pattern looks like so that, so that we can all plan really well and make best use of Sakai. And as I mentioned, uh, this roadmap effort is, is turning three this year. So it is our third birthday. We are officially a toddler, uh, putting our fingers in our mouths and uh, running around like crazy. Uh, I don't know if any of your kids were, were toddlers and they were, they were big runners. I mean, so uh, mine wasn't, thankfully, but I really hope that uh, we'll be a, a runner in the year to come that will really pick up the pace and steam ahead and really make a difference. 
So what does this roadmap process look like? And this is very similar to what this process has looked like in the past few years, and it's worked out pretty well for us. So in October of 2020 this year, I gathered some preliminary ideas. I had some conversations uh, within Longsight. I had some conversations with a few members of the roadmap steering team. And I, will, I can name all those folks a little bit later on. So I'm really grateful to those folks because they, they provide feedback at various points along the way to help make this roadmap as useful as it can be. So in November and December of this year, we'll be gathering some input. So this presentation is the first of those input gathering opportunities. This is the beginning of a process, not the end of a process. So following this session, I'll take the roadmap draft to the meetings of various Sakai community working groups and seek additional feedback. There'll be some review of the roadmap and the comments by the steering team in January 2021 just after the first of the year. And uh, the plan is to have adoption of a revised, thought through, uh, well-planned roadmap in late January, 2021. In past years, this has happened at Sakai Camp. Uh, but obviously being a, a COVID year, we won't have an actual Sakai Camp this year. So we'll need to figure out what kind of a meeting takes place in late January, where we talk about strategic issues as a community and adoption will take place at that meeting. And then starting in February, we'll have implementation. So uh, we're, we're still on track for a late December, very early January release of Sakai 21, which means that once uh, some of the most important and most pressing bugs are fixed, that'll land us in February. And so we'll have from February to August of 2021 to do some work and make some improvements. So this is our planning period so that we are ready in February to jump into action. So it is just about time for your feedback on the roadmap. Uh, before, before we move to that, I wanna pause for a second and see if there are any questions or comments about the, the intent behind this work and the process that we're seeking to follow. So feel free to unmute yourselves and speak up uh, or to post your questions in the chat if you've got any questions about process or goals of this effort. All right, any questions going once, going twice? All right, let's move on. So I, there's, a, uh, there's a link to the roadmap document itself in this slide. Um, I'm gonna switch the screen share to the roadmap document in just a second, but I wanna pose some key questions for you to think about as we walk through what's in there. So remember, there is too much in this roadmap. We have to curate it and do so in a smart way. So which uh, of the improvements, especially for Sakai 22, but also for subsequent years are most important? Which ones aren't clearly enough defined? So uh, which ones seem interesting, but really what it says on the roadmap doesn't really tell you what they're really all about. Um, and what other ideas do you have? What's missing from this roadmap? What ought to be added? What else, what other considerations Ought there to be. So I'm going to switch the screen share now. Hold on one second. So we want this document. All right, there we go. So this is version one that you're seeing right now of the roadmap for 2022 to 2024. And this is the version that includes the comments from the steering team. So thank you to the steering team members. And I will, uh, I will call out their names at the end of this session. So my, uh, my ask of you guys is that you uh, think during this session about this document, feel free to participate in the comment stream, feel free to add comments wherever you like, comments and suggestions in this document are welcome. So I'm gonna talk through it for just a few moments and then, uh, and as I do, you guys can comment in the document. Once I'm done, we'll open up the floor for a conversation and you guys can give me your feedback about this document. So let's take a quick look. As, as we did last year, this roadmap has four streams to it. One is new features, totally new features. Another is feature improvements, so making existing features better. Then we have technical improvements. Those are improvements to, to Sakai the application. And then finally, we have infrastructure upgrades. And these are uh, making sure that our libraries are current, that, our, uh, that we've made the kinds of infrastructural improvements that we need to make to set ourselves up for future. 
So let's work with this uh, in 2022 from left to right, starting with new features. So many of these features were pushed forward from 2021. We, as you know, we're, we, had a, we had a pandemic, uh, probably that's, that's not news to anyone at this point. And so there were several things that we looked to do in 2021 that we couldn't. So those have been pushed forward into 2022, which is why we've got too much in there now and need to curate. So what are some of those new features that are potentially on the table? There's a new global navigation that's been designed but not yet implemented. Uh, there is new UI for forms, tables, and tabs throughout all of Sakai's tools that has been mostly designed, needs a little bit of tweaking, and needs implementation. There's potentially a, a new forums tool that we might look at. So in a, in a pandemic situation, online discussions are that much more important for either fully online courses or hybrid courses. So uh, there's been a move afoot for some years to make forums better, and maybe this is the time. So what else? Program level analytics, finding ways to assess the delivery of courses and programs of courses to figure out how well we're doing, to be able to have the appropriate data for accreditation, to be able to have the data that we need to improve the delivery of our instruction in those settings. Uh, also on the list is an achievement service. And this is uh, essentially a way to gamify Sakai and allow for Sakai to track achievements of all different kinds at all different levels of granularity. You know, so you can imagine a situation in which uh, the first student in a course to have 10 posts in a forum might be able to get a special badge. Uh, or uh, a student who's uh, commented on other people's forum posts a certain number of times might get a badge or, uh, you know, contributions to student pages and lessons or first completion of a set of prerequisites or a, a set of, uh, of deliverables for a week that allows you to move into the next week. There are all sorts of different ways to think about this and an achievement service would capture that and allow, uh, allow us to gamify and recognize various achievements in Sakai. Unified messaging, this is something we've talked about in the past. Um, many tools in Sakai message, they tend to message in many different ways. And there's no central place to go to see where all those messages are. And there's no, there's no way for an app of any kind external to Sakai to consume those messages and push them out in, in ways that students can use easily. Two things that are new on the list this fall from comments that we've received. One is what we're calling smart notifications. So uh, our, our competitor LMSs have ways that you can set various conditions and get emails sent or actions taken based upon various conditions. So uh, emailing students, for example, automatically who haven't logged into the LMS in X number of days. Um, letting the instructor know that there are a group of students who haven't completed an exam, maybe creating, uh, you know, a, a, an automatically created group of students who have or have not met a certain set of conditions. So we, you know, there are all sorts of different ways to think about those smart notifications, but that's on the, this list of new features. And finally, uh, an integration with Microsoft Teams is also currently on the list. So I, I, I invite you guys to add more things to this list as I, as I keep walking through what's potentially on the list for 2022. So from a feature improvements perspective, we have a plan for replacing the current calendar UI with an open source uh, calendar front end called fullcalendar.io. So that's planned but not implemented. Uh, the UX group, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Wilma, are working on uh, workflow improvements for several of what we're calling our gnarly workflows. Uh, in assignments and tests and quizzes and in resources. Uh, there's been a suggestion to improve site info to make the joinable sites process a little bit better and a little bit more tailored to groups that, uh, that might be non-academic educators, as Martin Ramsey calls them, uh, selling access to specific courses for specific constituencies uh, you know, outside of higher ed. So there are search improvements that have been discussed but not implemented. Uh, there are a set of improvements to the grader, document annotation, which has been somewhat planned but not impl implemented, video feedback, which has been mostly done by EDF but not contributed. It needs a little bit of work. So those are some of the things on the list for feature improvements. So we, we move then to technical improvements. So Samago performance, especially in this moment when there are so Sakai is being used for, uh, for synchronous online high stakes assessments, Samago could afford some performance improvements. 
a grading service. We've talked about this in the past, uh, pulling all of the grading intelligence into a service and out of the tools that currently grade separately. Automation of QA testing or perhaps easing of manual QA testing. There's the unified messaging service that backs up the unified messaging new feature. There's our opportunity to replace reusable components like the file picker and the date picker with, uh, with open source uh, components from elsewhere that are, are ideally much more accessible than our existing components. Uh, several people have talked about Canvas compatibility for LTI integrations and recently suggested by Alan Regan from Pepperdine University are reliability improvements to rubrics. So great suggestions all. The infrastructure upgrades that are out there on the table, upgrading tools written in JSF1 to JSF2. So as of last check, there were seven. Uh, there might be, it might be fewer now. I think uh, one has been done since I last put this document together. There are a bunch of libraries that need upgrades. We had planned to do Velocity and Wicked and Java 11 um, this year. And so uh, recently suggested has been CK Editor 5, making sure that that's connected to all the tools. So, so those are some, uh, some things on the table for 2022. Looking ahead to 2023 and 2024, in the spirit of the very best uh, technology plans and higher ed. So we're, you know, in the year to come, things will be very well defined. In the year after that, things are a little bit less well defined, but our intentions are laid out. And the year after that is much more opportunistic. So for 2023, we might look at a messaging mobile app. We might look at a date wizard that allows instructors to uh, auto magically adjust dates in a course that has been carried forward from a prior semester. We might look at a totally new lessons. We might think about uh, cloud storage improvements uh, related to support for Box and Dropbox. From a feature improvement perspective, we might look at uh, further improvements to the grade board, uh, to the grade book rather, and that comes coupled with an infrastructure upgrade that replaces the, the hands-on table technology that, uh, that supports the grade book. Other improvements to greater instructional analytics improvements beyond what's been contributed in recent years by, uh, by Dayton and Western, so thank you guys for that. Rubrics functional improvements, a branding wizard that allows for skins to be created uh, by uh, by anyone, you know, by administrators like you, or if you choose to allow faculty or program leads to create skins, you know, a branding wizard might allow for that. We might have additional cloud storage improvements. We might have a resources integration, for example, for Google and OneDrive. On the technical side, we might look at, a, at some new technologies for our front end, potentially a new core module, more reusable components, more automation of QA testing. And uh, you know, on the infrastructure side, the retirement of RSF, finally, finally, the retirement of other obsolete libraries, uh, the upgrade to some of our core technologies in portal, although there's a conversation in the, in the comments, as you'll see, as to whether this makes sense to do so far out or not, and that's a very good question. And I would say in 2024, we'd seize opportunities, we'd continue to remove technical debt and make really smart decisions uh, in 2024 coming out of these next two years. So let me, uh, let me pause there. Um, so Derek, this session runs until 11.10, is that right? That, that is correct. Okay, so it's now 10.58, so we've got about 12 minutes. So what I wanna do is I want to open the floor to your comments. So feel free to comment in the document. Feel free to comment in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and speak up. So I'm curious to hear from you which improvements are most important, which ones aren't clear enough, and what else is missing from this. So let me look, take a look at the chat and see what we've got to address at this point. So, uh, so Michael asked for the link to the document. Sorry about that. I can post that in the chat again. My apologies. Um, so the, here, here's the direct Google link to the document and thanks to Antonio for putting the bit.ly link in the chat. <clears throat> Looks like we have several other links to the chat and uh, links to the document. So this is good. All right. Um, so now's the time for your comments. So let's start with this. Which of these improvements that are potentially on the list are most important? Hi, Josh. Christina here. Hi, Christina. I'm going to say for me, I'm going to say the most important would be trying to do the program analytics, the unified messaging, and the uh, smoothing out of those gnarly workflows. All 
right. Um, thank you for that. Um, so Lauren Finley writes full calendar integration and box integration. Harold Hale writes CK Editor 5. Amy, mm -hmm. what, what are you agreeing to? Josh, Amy's probably agreeing with me too. All, She's one of my <laughs> all the above. She's all the above. All good things. We like that. Um, and actually, Christina, I feel like I may have cut you off. Did you what did you have, have more that you wanted to add? Just that from my perspective, I need, you know, trying to focus on what will have the biggest impact on faculty and student workflows. So I think the notion of impactfulness is a really good measure. Um, do you want to say a few words about why um, messaging and program level analytics might be most impactful? Um, the messaging, just to make it so simplified for instructors to be able to communicate with students, for students to know where they can see their messages from the instructor. Um, there's so many different tools that are doing so many different things. There's messages, forums, announcements, the email archive. It's just a little bit tangled. Thank you. Um, the program level analytics, I think, will help um, be more impactful on the back end, helping the instructors and the deans and the administrators be able to pull that information for the accreditation reviews and everything without as much manual work, which then frees up more of their time and energy for um, not chasing down was this objective achieved. Okay, great. Um, and Amy is, uh, is is seconding that, essentially saying that the pandemic requires us to double down on on uh, streamlined communications. Yeah, great. I think the way that the instructors can send a message through a single tool, and it can go. You know, students don't have to worry about where they have to look for it. It comes right to them so easily. I'd love to see getting it simplified that it could be done by an app where they could have it on their cell phone and it beeps up at them and says, hey, your instructor's reminding you that you haven't done this exam yet. Definitely. And the gnarly workflows, uh, the number of time, the amount of time I spend troubleshooting instructors tr trying to get those set up is painful. It's stressful for the instructors. It's stressful for the students when a setting is not correct and the instruct they have to point it out to the instructor and the instructor has to go back and change it. All right, thank you so much for those comments. Um, I'd love to hear from other folks. So feel free to either put your comments in the chat or unmute yourself and speak up. What would you find to be most impactful? So Antonio writes in the chat, adaptive learning features, being able to establish a learning path based upon the resources access and the grades you get and a recommendation. Okay. Um, and Amy notes, uh, dates and times, better ways of changing on the fly and changing for some, not all students. I mean, we, we do have in Sakai 20, uh, a, a, a date manager where you can see all the dates for a particular course and go through and change them. Um, so the, the intent of the date wizard was to programmatically change them. Say, you know, move, uh, you know, if this course was last taught two years ago, you know, adjust all these dates forward uh, two years and a day, um, you know, adjust them based upon the, the, the start of this, this, this particular date starting the semester. So, um, so Amy, would you argue for the date wizard being earlier than 2023? Okay, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Quicker. Hi, I'm just going to mute because it's quicker. The date wizard would be wonderful if it could move up. But what I'm finding is um, like right now, I have 12 students across multiple classes who are in varying levels of quarantine and ability to be in a class. 
dates and times that I have to change for each student individually is getting to be onerous. And I can't just go in and open the assignment for everyone who hasn't submitted yet. I mean, I can go in and I can like, you know, allow resubmission for a group of students, but that assumes that allowing resubmission for a group of students, it's all the same date for all five of them or, or however many are missing something. Um, I'm constantly duplicating assignments and then making a group with just one student and then having to play fun and games in the background with a grade book so that that one student's assignment is set to zero and then I compact it and then at the end I have to go in and delete a bunch of assignments so my grade book reconciles correctly when poor Christina has to go in and scrape it for grades. Um, anything that allows me to think about an assignment with multiple flexible end dates and a student as being on a schedule separate from other students within the same assignment would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I, I totally hear you on that. Um, you know what would be neat? I mean, so the, the, the UX team led by uh, Sean Foster from Western University has been working through some of these gnarly workflows. It would be really neat to be able to write up that use case in brief and get it to the UX team so they can think about it. Um, you think maybe, maybe you and Christina could put your heads together on that so that uh, what you're saying could be fed into the decision making process around improving these workflows? Um, Christina, are you there? If you, if, yeah, if you send me the form that they want use cases written up in, I can probably knock one out. But I'm, I personally am now stuck in quarantine probably until after we're out of face to face. So yeah, I would happily write one up if, if I can get that information. All right. Well, so let's, uh, let's take that offline a little bit. So uh, Amy and Christina, maybe I can, we can connect you to the right folks and, uh, and that, then that, that would be amazing to feed that into the conversation. Let's see what, what else is in the chat. It's 1107. So we're starting to run low on time. Uh, let me uh, let me quickly acknowledge the uh, the comments in the chat, and let me let you guys know that this this document this roadmap document will remain open. So I definitely would encourage you after this session is done to go in and comment and suggest. Um, it's going to be open for probably several weeks, I would say, probably until the uh, at least the early part of December. I want to capture a bunch of comments from a bunch of different groups, and then I'll, we'll go through and do some iteration. So this isn't your last opportunity to comment. It's only your first opportunity. And I'll look forward to you know, your comments and your suggestions with, with a whole lot of anticipation. So in the chat, uh, Rebecca says, uh, before releasing a new tool, for example, rubrics or a rewrite, can the import of the tool be a priority to be tested? Yes, agreed. Um, we can do a better job of that, and we will. We've been uh, improving our QA efforts uh, over this cycle. And this is something that, that can be part of that as well. Uh, Tonko writes, a lessons tool, more storyboard style, drag and drop style, ease of creating relationships between parts and allowing for branching. Yeah, I agree. Uh, at, at Longside, we did some, uh, some UI work in re-envisioning lessons as a lightweight site builder. And that's the, the new lessons that's envisioned for 2023. Uh, one of the things that I'd be very interested in is uh, thoughts from folks. And if you could put these in the comments in the document, it'd be super helpful. Um, you know, is 2023 too late for a new lesson? Should it be earlier? And if so, what should we push out to 2023? So that's, uh, it's this balancing act that's always a challenge. So, but, but thank you for that, Tonko, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So let's see, Matt Clare notes, there's a narrative that Canvas grew from an LMS with no threaded forms, so what it is now because of LMI, uh, LTI rather. Um, being a powerful platform connector is a good look for Sakai. Yes, absolutely. So Dr. Chuck's been working on uh, improving our support for LTI. And so that's uh, that those support improvements will be in Sakai 21 have been backported to 20 and possibly also 19. Um, you know, but yes, I think, you know, we, we need to we need to double down on that. Uh, let's see. So other comments in the chat. Uh, Michael Green asks about uh, elaborating on on importing. Uh, Christina seconds Tonko's comment. Uh, 
And Rebecca, I've caught copying, copying tools between sites. Okay, great. <clears throat> so it is, it is 1109. These have been some really good comments and I'm really grateful for, for all of you folks being here. Um, so I really would ask you uh, to just take a few minutes and go into the document later when you've got some time and either put a plus one next to something that you think is a good idea, add additional comments of your own. I really, really, really would love your suggestions. This is, this is a process that's unique to Sakai. We, we together as a community hash over this roadmap, gather a lot of feedback and make a lot of decisions. So I'll be, you know, next up for the roadmap, we'll be bringing it to uh, the, the UX group and the teaching and learning group and the core team and the accessibility group and various other working groups. So you can expect that to happen in the, in the coming few weeks. So it is, it is 1110. I think we need to break, right, Derek? That is correct. Thank you guys all for, for your comments and thoughts and please keep them coming. Thank you, Josh. All right. Bye all. See you soon. Bye.